to have some at the very beginning whether ASEAN becomes slightly relevant and the presenters uh, with a not optimistic perspective, but he still I feel that ASEAN uh, remain playing uh, a very influential role in the, in the region in various ways, not only um, the building trust uh, as well as the uh, avoiding or managing the external interference um, in the internal affairs um, of um, countries in the regions. Um, as well as um, the big point about the challenges in Southeast Asia, as well as um, the external problems that um, uh, the region uh, is encountering with um, in recent year. Uh, his final is very interesting and uh, it might um, lead to uh, some discussion, further discussion about the role of ASEAN okay, um, in uh, managing and uh, preventing the great power competitions uh, between China and uh, um, let us move on to um, our um, second key keynote um, speaker, um, Mr. Song Sang Sai Shia, the Flawless Rose. Thank, thank you so much. First of all, uh, allow me to thank Tierra, the Ancestor uh, Peace Center, and also the Ancestor uh, Association of China for uh, organizing this interesting, very timely discussion today and also allow me to share exchange and views and also opinion with the expert from uh, the East Asian region. So I will uh, use 20 minutes. Uh, actually, I have a lot of information <laughs> to share with you, but I try to do it in the first round in uh, 20 minutes. I also know, uh, make my presentation in uh, three parts. The first part I go a little bit to be spent a few minutes on uh, the changing global and security landscape. And the second one on the uh, Asia Pacific or the so called Indo Pacific concept, which uh, derived from the Western and Japanese uh, concept together with the new international order in the perception of. China and also other players. The third one on uh, ASEAN. Let me uh, start on the changing global and security landscape. There's a few points. The first one, uh, there's a discussion on uh, we are whether now we are on the, the new international uh, order for the new international uh, system because there are a number of uh, factors. Uh, the first one, as Professor uh, Raymond also mentioned, that is the uh, Trump administration uncertainty and unpredictability also there quite a number of uncertainty and also, uh, if I may, confusion also in the international uh, system. And also the liberal order and democracy uh, has been challenged, I think, um, mostly in, in uh, this time or nowadays uh, more than in the past, and also the violation of international norms in uh, many respects, in many cases, both by the Western uh, countries or by developing or by the new emerging major power and so on. And also the uh, technological uh, development which create the cyber security, security and also the battle uh, for technology supremacy also create a lot of uh, effect on the new international order. The U.S. Uh, response to the uh, order according to the national security strategy of the United States issued two years ago, the U.S. view the changing geopolitics uh, as a geopolitical competition between the free and repressive visions of the world order. So uh, the United States still out uh, itself as the leader of the free uh, liberal international order 
At the same time, China also see the world as the international legal order, but in a different, in different way. China see the erosion of the existing international order because of the uh, unpredictability of the Trump administration, the retreat from multilateralism of the Trump administration, also the uh, rise of the far rise in Europe, and also uh, the spreading of extremism and international terrorism, and so on. So that's why China coming up with a Chinese dream and also their own strategy in uh, its effort try to reshape the international order and also a few other elements of the international order, for example, the uh, globalism and uh, nationalism, vis-a-vis -vis nationalism, as uh, we know that when the our administration uh, took office as taken office. Uh, it raised a lot of uh, questions about whether the uh, United States still uh, favor the globalism or multilateralism. At the same time, uh, as I mentioned, that the populism, the nationalism, and the far right uh, have been rising every part of the world, not only Europe, but the uh, rising of the uh, nationalism and populism in Europe and in Southeast Asia is quite uh, different in, in the form. And also, uh, the one who favor globalism also have, have to uh, score about modernization in the Western-led modernization and also in the new way of modernization a lot of countries in the Middle East also uh, favor modernization in their own way. So the tradition or the traditional beliefs are still very strong in many parts of the world. And uh, what it is one of the root causes of the uh, extremism and the uh, radicalism also in, in the world. So, of course, in the new international uh, system, the U.S.-China relation is a kind of one of the most anchored of uh, the uh, phenomenon of the international uh, system in responding to the rise of China. So now the uh, relationship between U.S. and China uh, become more and more the, the G2 relationship. A few years back, the big tax in China uh, did not accept to use the word G2, even it is in form of discussion. But now, I think more and more, even the Chinese big tank, the Chinese scholar, or the Chinese officials accept to use the word G2. So the relationship, the characteristic of the US China relation may be uh, the combination of the competition and partnership. Uh, different from competitive cooperation, so there are two sides of the coin uh, at the same time, always competition and partnership. The U.S. strategic direction is responding to the new international order, as I said, and especially responding to the rise of China uh, is the reflecting in uh, the U.S. national security and defense strategy also the concept of the Indo-Pacific, which uh, actually uh, come from Hillary Clinton I think, uh, many years back, but the current administration uh, used the uh, concept proposed by Japan to develop the concept of the uh, free and open Indo-Pacific FOIP. So the Indo-Pacific is something, uh, a kind of a broad concept in connotation with the rise of the Indian Ocean together with the, the Pacific Ocean uh, area. And then the uh, FOIP being open in the Pacific is a more uh, specific and concrete uh, concept. China uh, strategic responses to the uh, new international system, as I said, uh, represent well in the uh, Chinese dream 
concept if you build a broad initiative which cover the whole spectrum of areas ranging from economic trade, public diplomacy, infrastructure, uh, financial development, military modernization, and so on. When uh, Admiral Ali Hamid testified for the conference uh, recently, he admitted that the build-up of the Chinese capability, military capability, would very soon challenge uh, the U.S. in all two men, in all the men. And one of the reasons uh, in my uh, own analysis, uh, when China withdraw, or when the U.S. withdraw from the uh, IMF treaty uh, with Russia, because in the testify, uh, Admiral Henry Harris uh, clearly uh, mentioned that with the IMF, uh, the U.S. cannot uh, keep pace with the hypersonic technology of China. So I think this is one of the reasons why uh, the American withdrawal uh, from the IMF with Russia in order to allow uh, the U.S. to develop uh, with military capacity to keep pace with China. And also, as we know, uh, the uh, Chinese American relations also uh, very much in the battle for technology su su supremacy or technology less, and it also uh, the other side of the coin uh, lead to a lot of uh, actions in the cyber security and cyber attack. Five G dominance, the move I guess, as we all know. So the cyber security become I think, uh, one of the uh, very contentious, very serious issues in the international system and affect also Southeast Asia, how ASEAN and individual Southeast Asia can respond and prepare ourselves to the uh, technology less, to the cyber security, to the cyber attack and so on. And also in the international system, uh, a number of uh, global issues still have to be solved, uh, as you can see from, from the PowerPoint. And the second part, a uh, move to the Asia Pacific. I think as Professor Raymond also mentioned, that the changing uh, geopolitics, geoeconomics, geostrategy, and security landscape in the Asia Pacific, I think, uh, is the kind of the response on the to the rise of China and then the U.S. and uh, its allies respond to the rise of China and also other players try to find their own uh, space in the changing geopolitics. Russia try to re-emerge as one of the uh, major power in the region. Japan and India also uh, can play, play a key role. And uh, besides the uh, Belarus initiative, I think as a part of the VRI strategy, China has the close cooperation with Russia through greater Eurasia partnership, which encompasses not only Eurasia, but uh, also the former uh, member of the Soviet Union countries at the moment. So it reflects also the strong determination of Russia on how to come back, even though some analysts uh, said that the uh, Russia-China relation is a symmetry relation in balance, but it seems that the two countries have been with, uh, working together at, at the moment in uh, reshaping the international and regional order in the Asia Pacific. So this is I have my own analysis in the uh, rise of Indo-Pacific and geopolitics. At the moment, in the international system, I think it's quite uh, agreeable among most of the analysts that the rise of the Indo-Pacific and also the rise of China is the most important point in, the, in shaping the new international order. So uh, we have the American FOIP came open in the Pacific together with Japan. 
and then we also help uh, Japan uh, Indo-Pacific concept security dialogue India also try to uh, implement and to utilize the ACTIS policy ROK as the Republic of Korea has the South uh, or Long South policy and then the port which uh, is one of the key measures in the FOIP uh, of the uh, United States also uh, include uh, Australia to play a role there and then on the other side we have the uh, rise of China we have the World Initiative may have the better Eurasian uh, partnership and also uh, we have the bilateral, bilateral cooperation uh, among the countries uh, from uh, both sides of, of uh, this uh, picture try to also look for their uh, spaces and also to look for their own strategic direction so the point here is that even though it is a kind of uh, too competitive uh, mainstream in Southeast Asia, it doesn't mean even according to the national uh, security strategy of the U.S., it seems that if you are not with us, you are with them in uh, that uh, direction. But a lot, of, a lot of think tanks, a lot of uh, scholars in the U.S. try also to raise the point that that should not be the case because you can see even Japan on the one hand Japan uh, joined hand with the US in pursuing the uh, FOIP but Japan also in this economic cooperation uh, with China and Japan and Russia now on the road uh, to improve their relation try to look to solve the uh, disputed issue between the two countries and so on and then uh, the existing uh, security architecture in ASEAN, as you can see from, from the picture that we have ASEAN uh, and also uh, the sub-regional grouping in ASEAN, including ACMEC, TMS, ASEAN, uh, Ran Chang, as mentioned by Professor Levan and so on and so forth. Then this is the existing uh, one going regional architecture which is different from Europe. In Europe we have there there are NATO and also OSCE. Some of the Australian diplomat and also Korean diplomat also propose that uh, whether it is possible to have a kind of the OSCE organization in the Asia Pacific, which is uh, this uh, topic, this argument is not new. I think we used to discuss uh, whether we should develop a kind of organization along the same line as OSCE in the Asia Pacific uh, more than 50 years ago. But it uh, still uh, result in relying on ASEAN and ASEAN as a community. Let I go to my, my last part on uh, ASEAN. The first question, how the rise of China how uh, the uh, FOIP and also the Trump administration uh, fact the effect ASEAN and ASEAN security. I also share Professor Raymond's view that uh, for me the question of whether ASEAN is relevant uh, is not uh, frequently asked but rather the ASEAN, whether the ASEAN security is still relevant in this changing geopolitics security landscape in uh, the Asia Pacific and also in Southeast Asia. Because of the uh, uncertainty and unpredictability of the Trump administration may uh, uh, raise concern among some of the Asian member countries about the commitment of the US in the uh, Asia Pacific, including in Southeast Asia. Uh, even though a lot of things have seen Yes, uh, have the views that uh, in the Indo-Pacific strategy, Southeast Asia strategy is the key, is the most important factor in the Asia Pacific or in the free and open Indo-Pacific. But uh, I think because of the 
and predictability and uncertainty of uh, the of administration. The concern still there uh, among the uh, a lot of ASEAN uh, member countries. So it we saw in the different position of ASEAN in trying to uh, pursue or to deepen their cooperation with the US, with China, with Russia, and, and so on. Even though during the Trump administration, I think there are uh, quite a lot of positive movement towards Southeast Asia, uh, even though compared to the strategic liberalizing of the Obama administration, it uh, leave a less commitment uh, to, to my, in my views, in my personal views, uh, compared to the Obama people to Asia. But a lot of positive movement uh, still uh, going on. For example, the uh, passing of the uh, regulation or the, the act on the uh, build better infrastructure by the Congress and also the uh, bill, the act on the Southeast Asia strategy also passed during the Trump administration. But a lot of questions. Uh, the Trump administration still not yet nominated as an ambassador in Jakarta and also not nominated by a number of ambassadors in also in uh, Southeast Asian countries and so on. And uh, the rise of China also affected access and quality in terms of uh, now some of the uh, ASEAN member countries deepen uh, ties more with ASEAN. So it means like that in many cases ASEAN cannot come to the uh, common position or even issue with the common statement or have much more difficulties. So this is the effect of the rise of China of the changing geopolitics in uh, the Asia Pacific, the Indo Pacific landscape or the ASEAN centrality. However, in my view, there's no other better alternative to ASEAN centrality at the moment in the regional architecture. So the way forward we should ASEAN to try to strengthen its ASEAN centrality. Uh, then it go to my number two. ASEAN should be a kind of good uh, link between the uh, free and open Indo-Pacific concept, the Indo-Pacific concept, and the other concepts, uh, and the other side, BRI, GEP, and so on, so forth. Uh, so ASEAN can be, or ASEAN should be the most uh, important player in trying to link uh, in changing atmosphere, trying to neutralize uh, more on the uh, competition, on the rivalry among the players in, in the Indo uh, Pacific. And the third point is also linked to uh, ASEAN and also connectivity. I would mention a little before go to the South China Sea that. ASEAN connectivity uh, emerged uh, long before the concept of Belt and Road Initiative. And at the moment, Belt and Road Initiative do not have much link uh, with ASEAN connectivity. So uh, China expand an investment to South Asia, to Europe, to Central Asia, to Africa, to Europe, and so on. So, uh, as in uh, connectivity is in, in a good position to be the link between uh, BRI and also the concept of free and open in the Pacific, which the United States, Japan, and India also try to come up with the connectivity, the physical connectivity, the digital connectivity, and the people to people connectivity. Even uh, the EU uh, last year passed the communication or connecting Europe to Asia, aiming at also a developing infrastructure and connectivity to connect Europe to Asia. So I think ASEAN connectivity, which is in place long before, other types of connectivity can be in a very good position to link all those uh, connectivity. ASEAN and South China Sea, so the move 
the implementation of DOC and also uh, now working on uh, the draft COC, which would make a few, few more years from now, may not be as uh, quick as the, the United States or Europe want to see. But I think this is, in my view, also it is the best uh, scenario that we can have in the region because it's very complicated in dealing with uh, the new changing the Philippines or as Professor Raymond also mentioned, uh, taking different position uh, from the Philippines uh, under the Obama administration and also Vietnam also uh, different operation with China in terms of economic cooperation, even though in terms of South, South China Sea we are uh, still stand with the United States and so on. So the situation is more complicated and more complex uh, in the uh, Southeast Asia and South China Sea. The next point on how ASEAN uh, make contribution to the French policy in Asia besides the Southeast Asia is also a key. In the past, ASEAN used to play a key role in uh, making contribution to uh, look for a solution for the Korean Peninsula. Uh, 20 years ago, ASEAN invited North Korea to ARF uh, try to pave the way for the dialogue on the parties concerned. But it seems that now ASEAN play less role in other French points in Asia, Korean Peninsula, India, Pakistan or the border between India and China and so on and so forth. This is also the point that I said should seriously consider how to expand this role in the Asia Pacific. And also how I said respond to the military modernization or the military place in the Asia Pacific. As I said, the American already accepted that China could soon challenge the U.S. military capabilities in all domain, or even at the moment in some domain, China more advanced than the United States or Russia. At the moment, I think Malaysia, Singapore, uh, quite uh, develop their own different industry uh, very well. So we would like also to see the whole ASEAN and has more important to the different industry to the defense technology to more with the new uh, situation in Southeast Asia. And uh, also ASEAN should uh, utilize for the dialogue partners also to engage the key, all the key players in the region try to up a bit more uh, balance and more neutral way in uh, the Asia Pacific or in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. And in terms of uh, economic and trade. I think the most important point for ASEAN is how to move up the ASEAN economic community to the next level. At the moment, ASEAN, uh, the ASEAN economic community still stuck at only the duty free, the single market, the only duty free, but the non tariff barrier is still there. So I think for Thailand has the and Chairman, I said this year how Thailand can uh, speed up the reduction, the phasing out of uh, all the tariff barrier to make ASEAN more meaningful market and then prepare for the next step of ASEAN uh, single market, the uh, liberalization more on the service sector and also on the uh, technology sector and so on. And my last point also on the ASEAN single voice and ASEAN act together in the international forums. Uh, most of the think tank in Europe now uh, use the term ASEAN disunity, both at home and also abroad. So this is a challenge that ASEAN uh, should try to overcome by speaking more single voice. When there was uh, a permanent representative in uh, Vienna, there is no uh, ASEAN statement in the UN ODC, and so on and so forth. I uh, suggest that to the ASEAN ambassador there, and I hope very soon the ASEAN can move in the way that we can have more single-wide, blind 
then uh, it's possible. So that's uh, my, my thought on uh, as a response to the changing your uh, politics theory with the Asian landscape. Thank you.